So you notice that it's only quarter after and I'm starting to preach now. This is because Joel has no faith in the fact that I can finish it in half an hour. Actually, that's not true. I don't have faith that I can finish in a half hour. This is a lot to, uh, to think about, a lot to ingest, uh, but so important to how we live our lives and uh, <clears throat> things that we are encouraged with because these are things God has provided for us. Let's pray together. I'm going to supplement Joel's prayer by pleading with God myself. <clears throat> Father, thank you that you are here with us. Thank you that you've provided for us. And as we come to the time in which we are going to listen to the word, we acknowledge that we're weak, stubborn, dull of understanding, and uh, in need of your grace. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that not only will you make the word of God clear through my lips, but would you also apply it to our lives, that we might come away from this meeting with a stronger sense of loyalty to you and to your kingdom, and that we might be more obedient and willing to take greater risks depending upon you <clears throat> for all that you can do and will do in our lives. We're very much aware that we're in a season of our church's life where these kinds of things are very essential. We prayed this morning for the ICD as we are going to reach out to our international community, which is all kinds of nationalities. And so, Lord, we are not equal to these tasks. We're weak and uh, dull of hearing. That fits my category, and sometimes I don't understand what people say to me because I can't hear them well. But, Lord, we really need your Holy Spirit to help us to have courage and, and to listen carefully and attentively to the things people say. May we also listen with faith and speak with um, trust in you for the things you want to do. We don't want to tell you what your agenda should be or what it is, but we want to be submissive and as your servants to accomplish what you've called us to do. And so Lord, help us to be alert and watch and be ready so that uh, we're useful to you in this week. We think about the coming week. We are going to start ESL. We're going to be starting our pilot program. We really need you to help us with that too. We sense you're working already. their time and their efforts and Lord there's been a lot of folks saying hey listen I can do something here don't know what it is but I'm willing to give whatever I have five loaves two fishes whatever it may be Lord I pray you would multiply things that people have given whether it be just time or whether it be playing with the kids or whether it be teaching them or doing crafts with them or feeding them Lord whether it be teaching the parents and uh, sharing the gospel with them I pray Lord that uh, your Holy Spirit once again will work and grant us victory over the enemy. Father, also we're very much aware of the fact that uh, youth program is beginning again. Fall is the beginning of a lot of things. And so I pray for Joel and his team. I pray that uh, as they reach out to the youth in our, in our community, that there might be a, 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 a fruitful time this year. Fruitful in terms of growth in the lives and the hearts of the staff as well as the young people and may those in the young people who do not know you yet come to know you. May they be pricked in their hearts concerning guilt concerning the conviction of the law that condemns them. May they also be convinced of the, the provision of Jesus Christ and the adequacy that he has for all that is required for them to be forgiven and that given life and given a place in the family of God forever. So, Lord, I pray for them. I pray that uh, you will work in their hearts this year. I pray also for the regular ministries that we have with prayer. Tuesday morning ministry of prayer. I think of the Thursday morning ministry with the men who are praying as well. Lord, fill us with faith that we might uh, be able to stand against the evil one. And I and call upon you to do things that churches may not be able to do, but would you?
thank you for each person that we have in our church that has been different in so many different ways. Thank you for people coming from all different backgrounds and different nationalities. And I pray, Father, that you might help us to that we might work as an army, as a family, all kinds of uh, metaphors for us to understand how close we are to be with each other, how dependent we are to be upon each other. Part of the body before the head, and we need to submit to you and perform the way you want us to, and that we are to support and encourage one another. Father, I pray that you would enable this in a new and vibrant way that we might grow in, in, in faith and, and be filled with joy. Lord, may we not look upon ourselves to find our hope, but may we look upon you because you are the hope that we have. We thank you in all you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I want to say thank you to the uh, Valerio family for uh, a really excellent pig roast the other day. That was totally awesome. Food was really, really good. Music was even, well, it was good too. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It was fun. We really had a great time. Great time of gathering together and just getting to know each other and really being blessed. So I'm going to pick up where I left off this morning. We were just talking about that the feet shod with preparation from the gospel of peace. And it speaks to us about the fact that we are inspired by what God has done for us and we are prepared because we have received such wonderful things. We are prepared to give it to others. Being prepared is not simply being willing. It is being prepared in the sense of knowing what's coming and uh, knowing ways in which you can talk and to relate to other people. Uh, it's a willingness also to take whatever consequences may come as a result of sharing our faith. And a lot of times it's a very blessed kind of uh, consequence when we see people drawn to Christ, see people thinking about things that they had not thought about before. And so uh, we look forward to those kinds of things. But it, this preparation is that is a is kind of an alertness in which we are ready because we've thought through what we think we ought to be doing, and we're looking, we're searching for opportunities to glorify God in our lives. Of course, when we do that, there's always going to be pushback, right? This is a, as he's told us, we are in a fight, and our fight is not against flesh and blood. The people that we are going to encounter are not our enemies. A lot of times the enemy uses them and challenges us through them, but they are not. They are victims of his abuse. They are victims of his bondage. They are in need of being delivered. And we carry with us the ability to provide that deliverance. Because simply said, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We have the good news of the gospel, which Paul says is the power of God unto salvation. It's not, you'll notice there's no thing here about us being, you know, because we are really awesome. You know what? You know, we are so good at what we do here. And that makes us feel like, you know, we're really going to have a good time. But it's not about that at all. It's about him. We talked about going into battle as we sang tonight. Excellent songs chosen by Joel. And um, things that remind us of the truth that uh, we are in a fight and we are uh, not alone in this. Remember Jesus saying in Matthew 28, go and make disciples and lo, I am with you always to the ends of the earth. And I guess that's never going to run out, is it? It's always going to be that he is with us. Well, in the process, when we get pushback, there is a need for us to protect ourselves. There is this shield that Paul speaks about here. It is not really a shield. I mean, there, you don't have one in your closet, right? You did not find it this morning and pull it out and say, I'm putting on my shield of faith. It is a way in which you behave as a Christian that provides shielding. I talked to the kids this morning about putting on a shield. It was a raincoat that was so common. It was just simply like, oh, you put on a raincoat and that shields you from the water. Okay, you wash your hands before you eat and that shields you from getting germs. They got that. In fact, they were the ones who gave that answer. So it's a very simple thing we're talking about here. It is something that you provide. 
that God provides as we have faith, and he provides that for us as well, as we ask him for faith, he enables us to withstand the enemy. This shield on the armor of the soldier, of course, is one of two shields. One is small and one is large. The large shield is what's referred to here. The small one is something of this nature worn on the arm and it can be a, a weapon of offense as well as defense but you are protecting your body from the blows of the enemy but this big shield that we're talking about here is one that is two feet wide and about four feet high it's a shield that was uh, developed by the roman army in which the, the phalanxes would line up soldier to shoulder to shoulder soldiers shoulder to shoulder all right and pretty soon you have this, this whole layer of scales called shields. And as you're heading into the battle against your enemy, and they're sending arrows flying towards this group coming, well, these shields are, are lined up like this, and they just bounce off because there's no way to penetrate because the people know how to use them. Using them is, this, is all about this, where you have... You, you use the shield over a use of between you and what is coming in, but it's also you don't leave any gaps in between. There is a very strong necessity for shields to be like interlocked. They're so close to each other, there's no room for anything to penetrate. It was a very effective battle uh, tool for the, for the Roman soldiers. So we're talking about this kind of a thing, and he's likening it to faith. So when he likens it to faith, he's saying that this kind of thing, faith will shield you from the arrows of the enemy. It will stop them from hitting you before they actually hit you. There is this also this great need for the different soldiers to stay together shoulder to shoulder as they're advancing. Advancing is a good thing. We don't always, always think about advancing. A lot of times we think about, let's just put the shields up here and we'll sit behind them and hope that we won't get hit. And that's not the concept that he's talking about here, nor was it the Roman way of fighting. You advance and move forward. You're intimidating the enemy, but you are shoulder to shoulder. You need each other. You can't allow anyone to fall. You hold each other up and keep on going. So here we have this shield of faith. Faith that says, I believe in what God has told me. I believe in what God has told me. I believe he is the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth, and there is no one that has authority over him. Jesus said, I have all authority, and so you therefore go and make disciples. All authority belongs to Jesus. And so do you believe that? Do you believe that he has the right to tell you that you are to advance against the enemy in this world? He has the right to do that in Pennsylvania. You have the right to do that in Rhode Island. You have the right to do that in California, even though they are sure did not want you to do things like that. But uh, you have all authority. Do you have faith in that? Do you believe you have that authority? If you believe that, then when you get pushback from other people, it's not against you. It's against the authority of Christ, what we see. Now, there's this story in the Old Testament that everybody knows about David and Goliath. And you understand that there were Philistines. They were real soldiers, and they were a very effective army against Israel. And there was a great deal of danger in their having to fight together with each other. Especially when one man comes out and just says, you know what, let's do this kind of a thing. We'll have a champion on our side and a champion on your side. I will be the champion. I'm nine feet tall. Don't let that bother you. Just send out somebody that you have that could be a champion too. And then we'll fight and hey, we'll save a whole lot of blood here. Just one of ours will be shed. And then we'll all just understand that whoever wins becomes the people who are driving and the people who lose are the ones who are going to be serving. And so that seemed like a very, well, scary proposition, wasn't it? You think about Saul, King Saul stood a foot higher than everybody else. He was a person who was respected for his size, his strength, and his power. But Saul, somehow or another, couldn't get out of his tent. He saw this giant out there, and he was thoroughly intimidated. Size is so intimidating. 
I'm certain he was also very strong and powerful. He was a soldier since his youth. That is what Saul said to David when David said he would go out and fight him. But you see, Saul was not looking with the eyes of faith. He looked at himself. He saw himself two feet shorter than the guy who was about to he was being invited to fight. He was inadequate for this fight. And so looking at himself, he said, there's no way in the world that I can win in a battle with this man who is a giant. David, on the other hand, was a man of faith. David looked at the giant, saw how big he was, and then he looked at himself and saw how little he was, but then he thought, you know what? I'm gonna look at God, the one who is my Lord and is the creator of this universe, who has delivered me on a number of occasions. I, he was a man who was exercised in faith. It wasn't a new thing for him. It wasn't like he got saved yesterday, and now he's trying out something new. It was something that he had always kind of felt that God was with him, and God had demonstrated on a number of occasions. Now, you were here. You were here. Many of you have been Christians for a long time. And if I were to give you a little sharing time opportunity for you, and you would tell us, well, what sort of things did God do in your life that you know you could not have done? Only he could have done that. That was a God thing, you know? Well, any of you would have good testimonies to share because you have experienced that. But somehow or another, we're like the disciples. The disciples saw Jesus do incredible things, and they were wowed by those things and said, wow, what manner of man is this? And they got it finally. And from then on, they never had a doubt. You know, it's not exactly how it went, was it? They always had to keep coming back to who is he and what does he do and on my side. David had that himself he thought my God is with me and I cannot lose Saul said I cannot win I feel like a grasshopper in front of him David kept his shield up his shield was faith in God so that kind of developing things in your character in your life allowing God to do things that are more than what you can do by yourself will develop that ability and that shield becomes stronger each time you trust God for things that you know, you just don't know, know that you can do. This, this, this uh, <clears throat> pioneer program that we're starting, I, a number of folks are actually stepping in this. They're stepping out and saying, I'm not sure how it's going to go. You know, I'm going to do, I'm, I put myself there. I told them I'd be there. And I told them that I will do whatever is required. And they told me what I was going to do. And I'm really not sure I can do it. Well, that's an opportunity to develop faith. Because as you say, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to trust God for this. That's why these kinds of programs are so vital, especially at the beginning, because we're really casting our faith on him. You know, none of us are feeling like, I've got this. You know what? It's going to be so easy. It's a piece of cake. That's not what it is. And so when we do and we see God come through, why then our faith grows and the shield becomes more powerful as time goes on. There's this helmet of salvation that he speaks of here. This is a little confusing because all of these equipments, all these pieces of armor that is, come on the assumption that these people are Christians, right? This is the armor of God. God doesn't give his armor to unbelievers. He only gives it to believers. So why is it that we have to make a deal out of this helmet of salvation? What is he talking about? Does it mean that you've got to be saved? Well, no, you probably already are. And that's why he wants you to put on his armor. So it's not referring to being saved, nor is I don't think it believes it refers to assurance of salvation. But there is a connection. Assurance of salvation is something that we have when we're living faithfully with the Lord and we see him working in our lives the more we see him working the more we realize you know what god is with me god is doing things and uh yeah i have assurance that i belong to him and i don't think that's it either because i think that can come from knowing the truth you know the belt of truth that would fit there nicely and also with the word god and and other parts of the armor seem to fit in that. But there's obviously overlap but there's a clue here that helps us to understand what i think he is referring to when he talks about the helmet of salvation. 
Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn in them <clears throat> to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to start with this. Bible. Let's open it. You are looking, right? First Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> I want to begin with verse 4. But you, brothers, are not in darkness. Well, let's start at the beginning of the chapter because that's really good. Verse 1, now brothers, about times and dates, we don't need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So we understand the context here, right? He's talking about future things, right? So he's coming. The Lord Jesus is coming. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. This is the judgment of Jesus when he comes and destroys the kingdoms of the earth that fight against him. They will come on them suddenly as the labor pains on a pregnant woman. They will not escape. But you, all right, now we're focusing on us. You, brothers, are not in darkness so that they should surprise you like a thief. So we're talking about a day that is coming. It is Jesus coming. And he's telling us we need to focus on this. You should not be caught unawares. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. Interesting. In Romans chapter 13, the armor of God is spoken of as the armor of light. The armor of light. So you are of the light. You are of the day. What does light and day refer to? Well, he compar contrasts this with darkness. He says... So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled for those who sleep, sleep in the night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So here we are. We've moved right into the armor again. And this is the armor in the context of who we are as children of light. Light refers to the fact that we are righteous. Righteousness is our obedience to God, our desiring to be like Jesus. That's what we talked about when we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. Because of our love for God and our love for our fellow man, we desire that they might prosper in the kingdom of God by finding salvation and coming to know God in a personal way. This is what righteousness is. And he describes it here as children of the day, children of the light. Of the light. And so you understand why he uses that, right? I mean, you understand, when do people drink most? Well, he tells us right here, they drink in the night, don't they? Why did they drink at night? Because they really don't want to see the label of what they're drinking? Was that it? No, it's because they don't want others seeing them doing it that might cause them to be accountable for what they're doing. People who sin oftentimes try to do it in the darkness. And the darkness can represent simply being in the corner somewhere, even if it's in the midst of daylight. You know, it's about not being accountable. And we are not to be like that. We are to be people who love holiness. We are to be people who love goodness and we want to serve and be like the Lord. So we're not to be sleeping at night. No, that doesn't mean that you can't go home and go to sleep tonight. But he's talking about as you live your life, don't live your life with a dullness, with an un unawareness of what's going on. You know, there is this need for you to be able to see clearly what's happening. And that may be during a day or during the night. We're not talking about time frame here. We're talking about the realities of what's happening in this world. So we are to be the children of light. Now he talks about the armor in this process. Since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a, tr a breastplate. Now you notice that the breastplate here is faith and love. In the, other, in the other passage that we've been studying in Ephesians chapter 6, what is the breastplate? Righteousness. Oh, he was confused, right? Paul was not sure what he had said back in 
Ephesians when he wrote Thessalonians because, you know, it has to be the same. There has to be the same words because if you're going to be exact about this, you need to know what word goes with what piece of armor. Unless it's really not about the piece of armor itself, but the fact that these kinds of things act as armor to protect us in the times of battle. And I think that's really what he's getting at here. We can put it together as pieces of armor, but it's not connected just with that piece of armor. It is, um, it is about a whole way of living that protects us like shields, like uh, breastplates, like belts of truth, and all these other things. Well, he gets to the place where he talks about the helmet, and he calls it the hope of salvation. That's an interesting way of describing it, because back in Ephesians, it is the helmet of salvation. Now, so salvation has a wide range of meaning. We can talk about salvation in terms of conversion. I was saved, right? I was once living in sin. I heard the gospel. I believed it. I trusted in Christ, and God changed my heart. That's salvation. But there is a wider understanding of salvation as well, that begins at the point at which we come to know Christ. Actually, it begins before the world was even created. When we think about the fact that God chose us in him for the creation of the world. Salvation goes all the way back there, and it goes all the way to the time in which he comes to take us home to be with himself. For the great, complete fulfillment of all that God has designed for us and planned for us, and there's a way in the world that I can see or hear or understand what he's given for us. So here he is talking about salvation in terms of hope. I think that's kind of interesting and it's, it's informative for us when we think about it in the battle. You think about it in the battle and there's, there's suffering going on. There are people who are being killed. There is blood being spilt. There are arms being dismembered. It is an awful, awful experience. What? What keeps you moving forward? If you don't have to, what keeps you moving forward? You give up. You huddle into a little ball and wait out your time. You got 37 days, you hope that you live until the day is your discharge. But if you understand what's going on and you know the end, you know the goal, you know what's prepared for you, you know where he's taking you, and you know the fact from Roman, I mean Ephesians chapter 1, that the Lord Jesus is going to sum up all things together in himself and deliver them to the Father, to his eternal glory. You understand there is purpose. And you keep your eye on the goal. And this protects you. Your head is absolutely vital. When you get confused in the battle and you get hit so that you're not sure what's in front of you or what's around you, you lose your orientation. You are very vulnerable to being taken out and becoming ineffective. So he's telling us that we need to have this hope in place and continually looking to the hope and to the success of our calling. He didn't call us to fight against the evil one and to rescue people from the world who are bondage to sin to see it not happen, to see somehow or another that it doesn't work, that somehow it isn't us that he was going to bless. It isn't us that he was going to carry us into battle. It was somebody else. No, it is the hope that what we do through the power of the Holy Spirit will have eternal value. It will indeed accomplish what he has sent it forth to do. That brings us to the next uh, the next piece of armor, and we're, we're sailing along here, and I have hope that we'll finish on time. All right, we're talking the sword of the Spirit now. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How does one get the sword? Well, it comes from study, doesn't it? Coming from reading and understanding, think about meditating on the Word of God. Much more than just reading your chapter for the day, saying, I read the chapter for the day. It's actually 
reading that chapter in its context, thinking about who is speaking and thinking about what is he saying to me and what is there that I need to do as a result of what I'm reading. And you know what? That verse there, that verse stands out to me. It's not because I like it. It's really, you know what? I've had that experience a number of times and that verse really would help me. Maybe I should memorize it. Maybe I should memorize it so that when those things come, we all know our weaknesses, right? Peter didn't know his, but he found out pretty quickly what his was. Yes? Yeah. Pride was a real problem for him. And it took his denial of Christ for him to begin to understand what it was. But we get, we get it. We know there are things that we keep falling to. And we have things that we know are our weaknesses. And as we read through the word of God, he isn't telling us that you need to pick up this gigantic sword of Goliath. I don't know. When David went into the into the, the tabernacle and he was offered this one weapon, it was the sword of Goliath. I don't, just sort of like wondered, what did he really do with that? It was huge. You know, I don't know if he could even carry it and swing it. I'm not even sure that could happen either. What I'm talking about here is that he isn't saying that you need to know the whole Bible right away. He's actually speaking about the word, and the word that's used here in the Greek is arena. I believe you have a child that has that name, right? Arena? And what does that mean? Peace? Irene in Greek also means word. It means word. And it's not the word like logos. Logos is another word in the Greek that means the whole word. It is the big word for word. Jesus was the logos. What he's talking about here is the sayings. The sayings. This word of the Spirit is the sayings. The things that you remember. The things that you have stored away in your thoughts and memory. It is the same thing that Jesus used when he was fighting against Satan in the wilderness. Did he say, hey, listen, uh, we've got a lot of time here. I've been out here 40 days already, but I have memorized the whole Bible. So I'm going to just start quoting it. And uh, when I run across the verse that applies to you, Satan, I want you to take, care, take that to heart. Now, that wasn't how Jesus handled him. Jesus handled him by the fact that he knew verses that applied to specific situations. I have a feeling he knew a lot more than we do. But it is a good thing for us to begin to develop some sort of a repertoire of verses that are relevant to the kinds of lives that we live and the kinds of people we run into and the opportunities that we have to talk about the gospel. There should be these sayings that are part and parcel of who we are. So they come out like, you know, automatically. Oh, is, that's like this. I mean, that's like that. Now what we don't want to do is become a person who is always just kind of quoting verses. You know, that always is a little bit annoying when somebody just has no interest in you as a person, will not talk with you about your life, but they're very willing to quote a verse and say, hey, go home and meditate on that. That is not what they're intended for. But when you're dealing with Satan and his work against you, it is so important for you to know what the scriptures say and be relevant in those scriptures. Satan knows the word of God. He knows how to use it and he uses it out of context. Jesus never did that. He always used it in the place in which it fit. He's speaking here to, uh, here is actually the fourth chapter of Matthew and the fourth chapter of Luke. When he goes into this wilderness and he's speaking against the devil, he's tempted and Jesus, uh, let me just read it to you. After fasting for 40 days and night, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, that's a real attack right there. You know, you think you are, God has said you are, but if you really are, you know, I doubt that. And you should be doubting it too, because you really don't look like the son of God. You need to tell these stones that they can become bread or they should become bread. And so Jesus takes him back to Deuteronomy 8. And he talks about when the chief priests, uh, I'm sorry, that's not the, I'm looking on the wrong page. <clears throat> and he says, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here we have Moses speaking to the children of Israel. 
and he's speaking to the hardships that they had as they were in the wilderness. All that fits, doesn't it? Here he is in the wilderness himself. Here he is experiencing hardships. And Moses said God had brought them into this desert and provided for them every single day while they were there so that they would learn that they don't depend on themselves. They depend upon God. Whether I eat today or I don't eat today, my trust is in him and in him alone. And that's what Jesus said. By every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You know, God can speak and make these things happen according to his will. So these sayings should become part of the parcel of our lives if we want to have this sword of the spirit in a way in which we can handle it and uh, use it against Satan. Well, there's much more to it than that, but we'll suffice it. Jesus had a way of just kind of fitting things in. Oh, I'll give you one more example. Remember when Jesus is coming into the temple when it's Palm Sunday? And on a Palm Sunday, you ought to be using the Psalms. And uh, the, the, the people were criticizing him. You hear these children and what they're saying? And he quotes from Psalm 8 too, and he says, but don't you realize that uh, have you never read from the lips of children and infants? I, you have ordained praise. Yeah, he just happened to have that on his lips, in his mind, and he could use it. Would we know what to say? Would we have things that we might be able to quote. That's a challenge. All right, so now we've talked about all the different pieces of the armor. But you see, this passage is, it comes under two big headings. One is to understand that we are fighting a battle against spiritual forces and not against men. The second part of this huge uh, revelation is that we cannot do it in our own strength. Okay? Just like David when he came in and said, Saul, I'm going to fight. Saul gives him armor and he can't even put it on, can't carry it. You know, we cannot do these things ourselves either. We must depend upon the Spirit just like Jesus did. You remember that Jesus said things like this, <clears throat> if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God. Oh, wait a minute, Jesus, you're the Son of God, aren't you? And can't you have uh, this authority and can't you drive them out on your own? Jesus said, oh, I'm really kind of giving you an example of how you should live. I will depend upon the Holy Spirit while I'm here because that's what I've been called to do. And that is what you are called to do, too. So you watch and see what I do. And what I'm doing is I am depending upon the Holy Spirit. And so he tells us that we should pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Do you realize how many times he said all in that passage? It's a real wide scope, very wide scope on all occasions all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert always. Always keep on praying and praying for all the saints. So it's pretty much like, you know, put on the armor as you develop your Christian walk and as you're growing in your character. But as you're doing this, you need to totally, totally depend upon the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means pray. It means pray all kinds of prayers. Praying in the Spirit. What does in the Spirit mean? It means in terms of your relationship with Him. He is your, your counselor. He is your God. He is the one who is training you. He is your coach. And being in the Spirit is being in that relationship. You can call upon Him to do things that He's willing to do as your coach, as your helper as the one who motivates you and gives you the power for life. So this is the relation to the Spirit, submitting to his will, seeking his wisdom when available, and depending upon his power. And if his wisdom isn't available, you just do what you're told. There you go. That's doing it in the Spirit. On all occasions? Well, are you saying that uh, I haven't got time? Uh, I don't have any occasions. What are we talking about? Let's have times when we don't have anything specific to do, um, and yet we don't have time for prayer. We don't have time 
for prayer. Some of us have times when we are busy and we're doing things of lower priority than praying. We're filling our things, our lives with things that are okay. They're not sinful in and of themselves, but they crowd out the times in which we could be spending with God. Mary and Martha is a, a good example of Martha choosing a very good thing, but it wasn't the best thing. That's what Jesus said. In this particular context, Mary, you should have been Martha. You should be here beside your sister Mary, listening to the things that I have to say. So you all have occasions. I have occasions. So prayer needs to be woven into every aspect of our lives. We need to be so afraid of doing things on our own. Have we not failed enough? And we begin to realize, you know, the reason may be that I'm not committing it to the Lord. All kinds of prayers and requests, he says. That's a free flow of every possible way of communicating with God. Thanksgiving, confession, worship and awe, cries of desperation, shouts of praise, and expressions of frustration. All of it. Do that. And then that, be alert. That doesn't mean just do it with an awareness of what's going on around you. We need to be aware of the needs and praying for those who fight along with you. Always keep on praying. Don't ever give up. Make this a lifelong commitment and pray for all the saints. Pray for those you like and those who challenge you. Right? We tend to like to want to pray for those that are really excited about their ministry, like Marcos and Ruth. You know, those are the people that we want to pray for. But then there are others that we don't know too well or we don't care very much about. No, pray for all the saints, every one of them. Even the ones that seem so small and insignificant. 